Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on technological disruption and innovation at our nonprofit. Uh, my name is Josh, and I know some of you know me uh, from out here at Volunteer Mark. Have uh, kind of a unique <laughs> chat I'm going to run through with you all today. Um, some of this might seem a little out there, but bear with me on it. I, I will uh, bring it all back and apply it to us in our nonprofit work. But the bottom line of what I'm wanting to chat through uh, with you all today is this idea of what disruption disruptive technology is doing, not just to the businesses that we might work with and partner with, but what it could potentially do to us in the nonprofit space and the opportunities it could create, um, by the way. So just real quick, I need to give credit uh, for these slides. They are, are not my own. I'm using them with permission, if I can scroll up. Hopefully. So um, these slides came from a presentation that I went to that was actually one of the best presentations I've ever seen in my life, um, but it was put on by Peter Diamantis. This is just some information about that talk. Again, I'm just wanting to give credit here because these slides are, are, are not mine, but I do want to give my own spin on this um, from our standpoint as nonprofits. So. Like I said, this was from Peter Diamantis. Um, Peter Diamantis is the founder of Singularity University and the X Prize, um, which if you haven't heard of either of those, I'll chat about them, so don't worry, we'll talk through that. But just want to give credit to Peter here for this uh, great talk that he had put on. Um, the first thing, and, and really the overall focus of my chat today with you, is going to be on this idea of exponential technologies. What I was wanting to kind of talk about, what the whole focus of my chat here today will be on this idea of exponential growth. Now, this is actually something that we have all heard before, um, and you may not know it, but it's the idea of how quick technology, specifically computers, uh, will actually advance. And so I'll talk a lot about that today, but bottom line, that's what we're talking about when we talk about exponential impact or exponential growth is, is that idea. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why that's important to us or why that should be important to us in our work. And the first way I want to highlight that is through the kind of different, some changes around higher education um, that are going on. Like I mentioned, Peter Diamantis is the founder of something called Singularity University. And Singularity University, and it's just one of many really, you might have heard of some similar places uh, called Coursera or edX, but bottom line is what's happening here is there are some major universities backing it like MIT and Harvard that are coming in, but more importantly there are companies that are coming in. You see some of the names of the larger companies there like Google and Cisco that are coming in and actually having a lot of their VPs and professionals in that space come in and train individuals that otherwise would be in a traditional graduate program but are in more of a professionally focused program at Singularity University. Um, and this is really the way that higher education is shifting into a lot of areas and the reason I think this is important for us to be aware is because these kinds of models with the way that people are connected and the way that they are shifting to view education really more as on demand in other words as I'm growing professionally what is just the skill that I need to get to help me advance doesn't necessarily mean that I go to a traditional university but it might mean that I go through something like a singularity university or some kind of an online program where I'm linking up with people who have done it professionals who have been there I'm getting that skill I need and then I'm moving on in my career. That's really the way that the educational model is shifting in a lot of areas. It's not always the fit, but it's definitely shifting. And so that's important for us to know in our nonprofits, especially as we're interacting with our communities and talking to people about how to move into a better job or how to get a better education. The way that that is happening now is really changing. The days where we could just go to a traditional university for four years, get all the skills we need, and then move forward are really moving into the past on-demand education is really becoming an important thing. It's something we need to be able to talk about as we're interacting with, with our communities. Also, for us as nonprofit leaders, this is an important thing to bear in mind. A lot of these classes, uh, for example, one site I know called Skillshare.com, which is a lot like this Singularity University I have up on the screen, you could actually take classes, for example, from former executive directors, from former development directors, and learn exactly what they did to really take their nonprofit to the next level. And so thinking about yourself as a lifelong learner, well, knowing that education is a lot more on demand nowadays is a really important thing to bear in mind and something that, that we just need to be aware of because technology is really shifting us in that direction. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the whole focus of, of everything I'll be talking about is on this idea of exponential growth and technology. So 
what exactly do I mean by that? Well, let, let me, I'm not a math guy, but <laughs> I understand this math uh, that was presented to me in this talk. So let's say you took 30 linear paces. In other words, if you just put one foot in front of the other and take 30 steps, you would walk about 30 meters or maybe 30 feet. And so, you know, that's about all the further you would get. But let's say you took 30 exponential steps. Um, then you're talking well over a billion meters. And so that's just a, a good analogy, I think, in terms of, of us walking around. But what does that really mean? Well, like I said, it means that tech, since technology, technology does not grow linearly. It grows exponentially. And here's a big example of that. I am 29 years old. I didn't have a cell phone when I was, not, when I was in high school. Now, about 10 years later, I essentially have a supercomputer in my pocket that's an exponential trend in action and that's the speed at which technology is changing and we need to be aware of that and understand what this is doing and not be afraid of it by the way because it is going to shift things around but it's also going to create a lot of really new and unique and incredible opportunities not just for us but for the people that we serve and that's why I think it's important to understand uh, these changes so here's another great example I like of linear versus exponential growth Kodak's a company that we all know if you look back to 1996, you can see there um, how much it was worth. Uh, $28 billion. It had 140,000 employees. Uh, by 2012, it was bankrupt. Now, I'm sure most of you can probably guess why. Uh, it was the digital camera and digital photos that put them out of business because Kodak's business, um, really, they made some cameras, but their business really was processing that film and the chemicals that went around it. And so the shift in technology, the speed at which digital cameras advanced was what eventually put them out of business. But then here you look over on the right, that's Instagram. Um, in April 2012, they were worth a billion dollars with just 13 employees. Now that's an important thing to highlight too, by the way, because you look at Kodak in 96 had 140,000 employees to Instagram's 13. And this is something we're going to see going forward is that a lot of these new companies that are worth a lot aren't necessarily hiring as many people as they used to which will mean a lot for us again in terms of how we talk to people about how to think about positioning themselves career-wise in the new economy but also when we think about the kinds of changes that are going to impact us in our work at our nonprofits. Um, so here's another example. <laughs> uh, I, how many of y'all have rented a Blockbuster video in the last say year? Um, I'm sure there are no hands up because they've all closed <laughs> and the reason they've closed is because of Netflix a technology that disrupted what they were doing Netflix and Redbox completely disrupted the way that they do business and it disrupted it very quickly here's kind of a larger example of what's going on in our economy and um, they predict that in 10 years 40 percent of the companies on the fortune 500 won't exist um, also you'll see here in the 20s a company on the S&P 500 would last about 67 years Today, they'll last about 15 years. So what am I, what am I trying to say here, and, and why is this important to us? What I'm trying to say, bottom line, is that technology growing exponentially disrupts businesses in ways that they've never been disrupted. So what does that mean for us in the nonprofit space? Well, first of all, it means that the businesses that are often funding us are facing a completely different landscape than they have in the past, and we need to be aware of that and understand that and be able to speak that language when we approach them. The second thing's that thing that it means, though, is that if technology and the, the speed at which change is occurring has the power to transform businesses in this way, it absolutely has the power to transform us in terms of what we're doing at our nonprofits. And so that means that we need to stay on top of these technological advances and be aware of what is coming out and how things are changing so that we can react at our organizations and so that we can continue to grow and thrive in this new landscape. Uh, here's another example. Uh, remember I mentioned those companies that grow very very fast to be very valuable with without very many employees well here are several examples of companies that are worth over a billion dollars today usually forming you know from inception to being worth a billion dollars you're looking at about four to five years well that didn't happen twenty years ago you didn't have these large companies coming up in four to five years that would be a twenty-year process for a company to grow to that level um, so that's just kind of another example of the speed at which things are changing. Here's another good diagram I like. We've all heard this before, you know, Moore's Law, the, 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 the speed at which computing power doubles. Um, and this just shows how quickly computing has grown um, over the last several decades. Now, again, I, I want to bring this all back to why does this matter to us? Why, why should we care? Well, here's why, and this was one of my favorite parts about the talk, um, was, the, now he had the 6D framework, but really we only need to be worried about the 4Ds, is the idea of, of, of the 4Ds framework. 
And so, and I'll break each one of these down, but no going into this. Here are the four Ds that I'm going to talk about. The idea that technology and that these changes are disruptive. They change the way that society is constructed, that business is done, that we organize our nonprofits. Um, they dematerialize things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is the most interesting thing I think for us. They demonetize things. The speed at which technology is changing has the power to shift money around very quickly. You saw that with Kodak, Kodak going bankrupt and Instagram growing that quickly. That's demonetization. That's technology moving money around. Uh, but the real exciting thing for me is the power of technology to democratize to give a voice to those who were formerly voiceless. And that is a really powerful component of it and something that I, I believe we should all be leveraging in one way or another in our nonprofits. But I'll talk specifically here uh, right now about how I think that can happen. Let's first of all just talk about this idea of dematerialization because I think this slide is really fun and <laughs> funny. So you look at this guy, I mean he's got all kinds of things in his hands. But this was, you know, say this picture was taken in 1985 or so, the year I was born. Um, well, 20 to 29 years later, all of these things are fitting in your pocket. Remember, I talked about that supercomputer I have in my pocket. Well, it's called an iPhone, and it happens to fit all those things in it. That's the idea of dematerialization, um, completely shifting those things around. And you can just imagine the number of businesses that were disrupted, the number of things that were disrupted as those technologies kind of rolled into one. Okay, so demonetization. What do I mean by that? Well. As I mentioned, that's simply the idea of money moving around. So you can see a lot of examples of companies here, examples we know. Uh, if you haven't heard of Uber, it's essentially a, a program to turn your car into a sharing vehicle, to turn your car into a taxi, and you just have a smartphone app where you can link up with other people who need a ride based around this idea of community. Amazon, we all know, has really uh, put a hurting on bookstores, Craigslist on classified ads. So. That's what I mean when I say money shifting around. But here's an important thing I think about these these companies and, and why this matters to us. You know, take Uber for example. They're not just about disrupting the way that taxis did business. They're also about building a community. They are about connecting people in ways that they haven't been connected before. Because with Uber, you're just a person living in your city and you're sharing your car with others who need a ride. You're linking up with them based on the app, but that's really what Uber is all about, is this idea of building community. Um, same thing with Skype, for example. Uh, you know, Skype has just completely destroyed the idea of a long distance call because I can communicate with anyone I want to around the world very easily and free. So those kinds of technologies, not only do they shift money around, but they also have the way a way to innovate the way that we view and, and interact with our communities. And so what I want you to think about here is, you know, for us in the nonprofit space, how could we be the next Skype? How could we be the next Uber? And I don't mean that from a business standpoint. I mean that how could we be the next organization that helps build community in the ways that they have, that helps break down barriers that people formerly face to communication, to transportation, to linking up with the things that they need? How can we think about ways that we might be those organizations? If you're not thinking about that in one way or another, you need to because as you can see in the business space, these new and innovative companies have had the power to crush old and established entities. And that's something that could very easily happen on our end as well if we're not constantly keeping ourselves up to date in terms of, of what's going on and thinking about ways that we can be creative and come up with innovative solutions to older problems. Okay, this is my favorite thing, and I think this is the one that applies most directly to us, is technology's power to democratize things. Now, I, I love this chart because I think it illustrates it very beautifully. By 2016, there will be a billion more cell phones in Africa. Now, a lot of those are going to be smartphones, and for a lot of people in these situations, that's the only way they connect to the Internet. So that is a billion more people connected to the internet that can connect with each other, that can converse, that can link up to information that they've never had before. And when you give a voice to that many people who have been formerly voiceless, that is an incredibly powerful thing. The example I always think of here is, is what we all saw happen with Egypt, with the revolution. By all accounts, the fact that so many more people were connected on Twitter and able to organize that way, that had a lot to do with the way that those protests were conducted and the way people organized for change in that country. Um, so that's just one example, but again, thinking of the power of people who are connected and informed and what they can do to spark change given that so many more people will be connected, I think is a really incredible and important thing for us to think about. Okay, so now this is just a, a fun little break here, but it, it is an interesting topic that I think we all, all should think about. In uh, the presentation I saw, there was actually a video of this, but I, I couldn't quite get it to carry over, so um, you'll just have to 
hear my story on the picture. But what you're looking at are two Jeopardy champ champions, one, the guy on the right and the guy on the left. In the middle is a computer called Newton. Um, now this was built by IBM. Um, now Newton here is actually playing Jeopardy and Newton is completely disconnected from the internet. He has no access to the information superhighway. But what IBM did do is they dumped Wikipedia's database into him and then put him up against these two Jeopardy champions um, as you know questions are getting thrown at them. And in the video you can see this computer as you can see the the humans are not doing very well in this one. Um, but I, I, you see in the video the computer is answering questions very quickly and effectively. But the, the most important thing is not so much that the computer is answering questions and able to process those facts. It's that the computer was disconnected from the internet and still able to understand all the different nuances of the, of the way that a human was answering questions, of, the, of reacting to the humans next to it. And that's the most important thing. And I, I'm, I'm telling you this just to highlight very clearly how quickly technology is changing um, and, and, and the way that it is shifting around. And now I want to stop here because I know that this idea might seem a little scary and to be honest with you this Jeopardy video seemed a little scary to me too at first. But I'm not trying to present this to you to scare you. I'm trying to just present it to you to share with you some of the interesting things that are happening, some of the ways that technology is changing so that we can think about ways that we can use this to better society and better our communities. And that's really what I want to be the focus of, of what I'm chatting through here today. But let's get a little more specific in terms of what are the technologies that are changing that are, are really going to impact us and the people we work with over the coming years. Uh, well, one thing I just want to chat through real fast, first of all, you know, I mentioned that Kodak had, had gone bankrupt due to the digital camera. It's funny that it was actually Kodak that invented the camera, the digital camera in 1976. Well, a guy at Kodak, this guy you see there, Stephen Sasson, um, invented it in 1976, but it was about four pounds, cost $10,000, and put a .01 megapixel picture out. <laughs> so you can see why Kodak might have scrapped that. But another reason they scrapped it is because, like I said, their business was in developing the chemicals in the film around photography. Um, so when the digital camera finally came about, it was then able to disrupt them pretty severely. Um, but another important thing to note here is in 2014 now, the digital camera, 10 megapixels at .03 pounds for $10. So as these technologies are shrinking, what that means, and you see another example here of the accelerometer that we all have in our phones. Well, in the 60s, that was 50 pounds and cost millions of dollars. Now it's a little $3 thing in your phone. The point of all of this is that these sensors are getting so small that they're now going to be on virtually everything. And specifically, one thing that I think is, is really interesting and important for us in this space is that a lot of sensors are going to be tied to personal health. And as we are able to know more about uh, the health situations of people and, uh, and about their backgrounds and about their activity and that kind of thing, um, that's going to allow us to, to make better predictions about keeping people physically healthy, keeping people emotionally healthy, those kinds of things. Um, again, I, I know some of that might seem a little scary, but that's just kind of the direction that things are headed. And we need to know that and be aware of that as we're continuing to serve people in our communities so we know what's, what's going to be coming at them. And this is another fun example. That thing on the left is the first commercial GPS receiver. You can see they're 53 pounds and about $120,000. <laughs> know, try putting that in your pocket. But now we have these things that are $5 each that we put in our phone, and that's a GPS receiver. Does the exact same thing, probably much better than that thing on the left. Okay, here's a really important slide that uh, I want to chat through because it, it will be directly affecting our communities and the people we work with. Uh, you look at this picture and you'll notice the, this picture of this factory floor. Now, this is a picture of a, a car maker. I'll tell you who in just a minute. Um, but it's, it's a brand new factory from a car maker. And this factory is now in full operation as you see it there. Uh, but you'll notice there's only one person on the factory floor when it's in full operation. Um, we've heard of this before, and this is just due to a continuing trend in technology, but robotics are getting so advanced that it's drastically decreasing the number of people that are needed in these kinds of factories. Now, the other side of that is that, you know, the, as, as this changes, it creates new opportunities elsewhere. And that may be true, but we do need to understand that these kinds of things are going on because a lot of the people that we're working with 
will be displaced as these technologies change and we need to be prepared to offer them direction in the new economy and in, in these new technologies that will help them. So coming back to my example of education, that's a tremendous opportunity to go and get new insight and new skills you know, if, if you need to as these technologies advance. Um, and again, I'm not really trying to say that's a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying it, it is a thing and we need to be prepared to address it as we interact with people in our community. And also, by the way, it applies to us as well, like I said, in our nonprofits. As these things are changing, we need to keep on top of, of, of what's going on and how we're connecting. And so that's all the more reason for us to continue uh, along that track of becoming lifelong learners. Okay, um, I'm not going to chat about that, uh, but you've heard about it before. It's Google's car that can drive itself. <laughs> we'll see what happens with that, but that's another interesting technology. But I want to chat about this because I do think it's important. And again, I'll, I'll probably seem a little out there with this at first, but uh, hear me out because I do think this is a, a really important thing for us to consider in a lot of different spaces, it is the idea of 3D printing. Um, now, basically, what 3D printing is doing, uh, for one thing, there was a video here where I watched a construction guy when he was out on a job had forgotten his hammer, so he walked over to a 3D printer and it printed out a hammer for him, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. But what 3D printing is basically doing is it's completely shifting around the way that manufacturing is done. So formerly we needed these large buildings, large machines, large infrastructure to take raw materials and, and just basically uh, bend them around into things like you see some uh, jet engines and, and different things like that. Well now, 3D printing has completely shrunk that down and kind of coming back to the idea of, of robotics, it's basically changed the way that the manufacturing industry does business completely. And as we've seen with a lot of these other businesses that have gotten disrupted, what that means is things are going to get demonetized, certain companies are probably going to close, new companies are going to crop up, jobs are going to get shifted around, all of these things are going to happen as the way that we manufacture changes and we need to be aware of that and again knowing what are the new skills in the new economy that we can help people get and I think that that 3D printing is really going to shift some things around. Let me give you some specific examples of what will happen there. Uh, you can see in the upper right, uh, now this is in the early stages, but 10 3D homes were printed for $5,000 a piece in 24 hours. So you know, as that grows and as that expands, and I'm confident it will, what is that going to do for those of us working in affordable housing? Um, what is that going to mean for us working on policies that relate to affordable housing? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question except to say that it's going to change the map. Um, it's going to change our game plan. And I don't know that it's going to change it tomorrow, uh, but it will change it at some point in time. And, and knowing that these changes are on the horizon, and continuing to keep ourselves up on them is, is a big part of what I think we need to be doing. Another great example there in the bottom left, uh, that leg there is a prosthetic leg, but it was 3D printed based off of a copy of that individual's left leg who is playing soccer. Um, and that is, I think, one of the largest uh, avenues for 3D printing to go into is in the arena of healthcare, um, prosthetics, and they've even talked about um, certain kinds of, of, of organs and things like that in 3D printing. Um, and so again, I, I just think this is a technology that has a lot of power um, to drastically change the way that businesses do business, but also that we operated our nonprofits. But most importantly, it's going to be impacting our communities. And so we need to be aware of how to talk to people and how to connect with people as these changes change the way that they're used to working and living um, in the communities that they're in. Okay, so. I just want to highlight this real quick so you know uh, what the companies that we're working with, and a lot of these companies are supporting our work. Here's what they're facing. Um, they know that the only constant is change, and the rate of change is increasing. Um, they know that they have to disrupt what they're doing, or someone else is going to come along and do it. Remember Instagram and Kodak. Um, competition now can be just an individual who comes up with a technological idea in their basement. And so these companies have to be afraid of that. Um, and if you're dependent on, and this is something that I think is important for us as well, if you're dependent on innovation solely from inside, um, you will lose. And so first of all, be aware that any company that is contributing to you is, is concerned about that. But more importantly from our standpoint, be aware that it is more important than ever as we are seeking to grow our nonprofits, as we're seeking to increase our impact, as we're seeking to maximize our connection to volunteers, it is important to look outside our organizations for ways that we want to do that and ways that we want to get creative. 
different because remember, everyone's running around with a supercomputer in their hand. And so the more people you can get when you're struggling with a critical problem at your nonprofit or, or need new ideas, the more people you can get involved, even if they're from outside your organization, the better. And by the way, technology has made that a lot easier. If you have a social media presence, you can ask your audience how they feel about a change you're wanting to make. Now, certainly there are some confidential things that you have to keep in-house, but you know, there's no, no harm in asking for insight on certain things. You could do that with your social media presence. If you have an email list, you can, you can do that. Leverage technology to react and respond to technology and to continue to innovate in your organization is, is really the, the moral of, of that story. Okay, the last bit that I want to talk about, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that the guy who, who led it, Peter Diamantis, had formed the X Prize. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute, but specifically I want to talk to you about why this is so important to us in terms of how innovation is coming about and how leaders are thinking about innovating around social problems. So let's let's talk about this real quick. I want to start uh, with this idea. Now I've mentioned this before when I talked about how many people in Africa are going to be connected. Well let's look at this globally. In 2020, 66 percent of the global population will be connected to the Internet. That's a huge change from today. Well today it's probably about 30 some percent. You can see that's 2010 there, but 30 some percent. That's, that's almost a doubling. So what does that mean? That means that's three billion new minds who can create, who can discover, who can consume, who can invent, and who can desire things. And let me tell you, that alone will radically transform the way that we serve people. It will also, by the way, radically transform our definition of the communities we serve. With these new minds connected and wanting these things and, 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 and needing things, how are we going to respond as nonprofits? How are we going to address these needs? And a lot of us, I think, have a responsibility to do that from that innovation standpoint. As these people are getting connected and informed, they have things that they can contribute, insights that they can contribute, and we need to consider that as we look for innovation in the outside, as we look to connect outside communities, look at connecting with these new people who are coming online in these new areas. Um, that's something that I think will just dramatically change the landscape for really all sectors of society, and, and we in the nonprofit space definitely won't be immune to it. Um, but let's get back to the X Prize idea, and I want to start with kind of a fun story here uh, that he told. I didn't actually know this uh, personally. I, like Peter, had always thought um, that Charles Lindbergh, in the spirit of St. Louis, that Charles Lindbergh was just kind of a an adventurer, and he woke up one morning and decided he wanted to be the first person to fly solo on a transatlantic flight. And you know, very very heroic notion of him. And I'm sure some of that was true, but come to find out that the whole reason that that happened was there was an actual there was an individual in New York, a very wealthy individual, who put forth a $10,000 prize to the first person who could do it. So Charles Lindbergh was simply the first one who actually managed to do it, but there were multiple teams competing for this prize. And so that is something that started there, this idea of, of the, these kind of prize incentives around a particular problem. Um, and it's really grown since then, and it's definitely been the focus of a lot of leaders as they've tried to solve social problems that they face. But let's start with the idea of where the X Prize started. The, the issue that, that they were trying to work through um, was creating private space flight. And so what they did was they created a very large prize, a $10 million prize, and put certain stipulations on it. You had to fly a craft up to 100 kilometers, which is very high, way up into space. You had to do two flights within two weeks. So you had to prove that you could do it and then do it again. Um, so they put this prize out there, again, trying to spark innovation um, in an area where NASA had really been the only players in the game. Well, here was the result of that innovation, of that prize being put out there. They had 26 teams coming from seven nations that resulted in over $100 million of spending around this particular issue. Now, I, I know this is space, and, and <laughs> it's uh, literally out there for a lot of us in, in the nonprofit world, um, but my point here is that this one prize, this relatively small prize in the scheme of how many people started working towards it, created so much thought and so much innovation around a challenge that we had. And that is a really powerful idea. I was going to finish through. I wanted to just highlight this last one. Uh, so this is kind of capping my story about the spirit of St. Louis. I talked about that first craft that went up into space, was able to do it twice. Uh, here it is in the Smithsonian Museum sitting right next to the Spirit of St. Louis, which really inspired the whole story of creating a prize around innovation.
So let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Okay, uh, next slide on that. We can skip over that one. Now, this is, so those people you just saw, the X Prize has now gone on uh, to innovate specifically around social challenges. And I, I just share this uh, kind of to close on what I think is a really exciting note, um, just knowing the kind of innovation that they were able to spark by launching a prize around space, uh, I, I think there are going to be some really fascinating things that will come up as they've now focused in these prize groups. And they've got some really, really major people uh, leading the charge on this, but they're trying to create uh, new innovation and social change around life sciences, energy, and the environment. And what's really exciting for me is learning and global development. Now, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's an example of, of, of what I'm talking about. All of us know about the Gulf oil spill that happened recently. And at the time that that spill happened, one of the big problems when an oil spill occurs, I didn't know this actually, but uh, is that not so, it's bad enough when it spills into the ocean, but by far most of the problems occur when it actually hits the shore and then just wreaks havoc on those ecosystems. Well, at the time that the Gulf spill occurred, we could only clean up about 1,100 gallons a minute of oil when it spilled, which is just not nearly enough to keep it from going to the shore. Uh, this is the part I didn't know. In the Exxon Valdez spill in 1978, you know how much we could clean up at that point in time? Exactly the same, 1,100 gallons per minute. So the point is, from 1978 until when the Gulf oil spill happened just a few years ago, we had not innovated around oil spill cleanup. And the X Prize saw that as a massive social problem. And so here's what they did. Let me go ahead and flip slides. They wanted to dramatically increase the speed at which we could clean up oil spills. And so they put out a prize. Uh, again, same idea, certain amount of money, um, had to do it under certain specifications. They wanted to at least double the speed at which we could um, clean up oil. Seven of the 10 finalists managed to double it. The top team, the team that won, did six times the amount of cleanup. Um, in other words, six times the amount of cleanup that they, that they were able to do in the Gulf. Um, so again, this is just an example highlighting the power that these kind of new models around innovation, especially social innovation, are having to really spark some serious changes. Let's go ahead and move on here. We'll chat about a few more. We'll go ahead and skip over that. That was, was a video that <laughs> was once there, but didn't carry over. Um, so, this is, I've mentioned this a few times on this call, and I want to highlight it again because this is really, really exciting, and I think where we're going to see a lot of changes um, is the idea of healthcare and mobile health. And there are so many new technologies that are coming up that are really trying to uh, put, uh, like, specifically put people's individual health records into their hands, into an app on their phone. And what that does is it just makes the whole organization a lot easier, but more importantly, it allows people to kind of keep keep track of some different preventative things and some different things going on with their health uh, right in the palm of their hand. Now, obviously there are limitations to that, but the reason I'm highlighting this is because I think there are going to be a lot of really neat technologies around healthcare that help people keep up with what's going on in their lives and help them keep themselves healthy at a relatively low cost. And we need to be aware of those things because I, I know that in a lot of the communities we're, we're working with, um, public health is a, is a major concern and the health of the communities that we're working in is a major concern. And so I think the technology will present a lot of new options. Now, certainly it, it won't be the overall solution, but I think it will be a piece, a piece of it. And so keeping aware of, of what's out there, especially in the healthcare technology space, I think is really important for us. Um, go ahead. And this is another interesting thing I wanted to point out. So the X Prize, when any innovation they're wanting to do around healthcare, they created a prize around just like with, with the Space Prize. But here's the thing. If a company or even if we as a nonprofit just try to innovate within our organization, we only get innovation from one space and really one voice. But by doing these prizes where they try to get innovation from all around, you can see here the number of teams from around the world. Uh, I mean, they have teams from all over the place, 330 total teams, 33 nations coming together. Now, why is this important for us? Well, remember when I said uh, that it is important to think about innovating and, and bringing in creative ideas 
for your organization from outside your organization? Well, look at what they've been able to do in terms of that. And again, the good news of the internet is that it allows us to connect with these teams and to get these ideas from places we would have never been able to get them from before. Go ahead. Okay, and I'll close this out with this. Go ahead and one more slide over. Okay, so I mentioned to you that, and I, I'm gonna end in the, in the same way that I started. Uh, for me personally, education is a huge passion of mine. I teach at a university, and I, I think that there are a lot of things that are shifting around in there, and a lot of them for the better, but a lot of them will create a lot of challenges for, for a lot of us. And I think that gets the, the, the message of my whole talk. Like I said, I'm not trying to say that any of this is inherently good or bad. It just is, and we need to be aware of it and ready to understand and respond to these changes. But what the XPRIZE is doing specifically with their Global Learning X Prize is trying to get tablet computers into the hands of hundreds of millions of kids who have not had them before and plug them into information they've never had access to before as a way of getting education into places where it has just never really been able to reach, either for some kind of an infrastructure reason in that country or lack of a school building. Um, those types of things are, are the spaces that they're really trying to get into. And again, I, I want to leave us on that note because I want to encourage you. I know that as I went through some of this, and, and I felt the same way when I was at that talk, some of it seemed a little out there, some of it even a little scary. But the message that I'm sharing with you today is that as with any change, there is always incredible opportunity for great things as there is some opportunity for some scary things. But let's focus on the positive possibilities of these changes. And I think just most importantly, think about how we can use these changes to impact more lives, to impact our communities more deeply, and to connect more fully with the people we serve. And I think that this idea of what the X Prize is doing for education and what technology can do for education, healthcare, life sciences, disaster cleanup, I think are prime examples of how exciting this world can be if we embrace it, understand it, and try to implement it in the ways that it makes sense at our organizations. So that's my message for today. I want to thank you all for joining us on this webinar around disruptive technologies. I, I do apologize again. It's, it's funny. It's ironic. We're doing a webinar on technology and we had so many tech issues, but I appreciate you all bearing with us on that. And I do want to go ahead now. Uh, if anyone would like to, I just ask a question in the chat. We'll be here for another few minutes. Um, glad to answer your question, but if you need to run, uh, totally fine too. But thank you again for joining us here today. Uh, from the team up here at Volunteer Mark, we just appreciate your time and, and thanks for joining us.